Good evening, this is the Greenfield Public Schools Special School Committee meeting for Monday, March 14, 2022. It's 6 p.m. We're in the Greenfield High School cafeteria at 21 Bar Avenue, and we will go right into our first agenda item, the roll call and call to order. Secretary Ekstrom, please. Member Deneve. Here. Secretary Ekstrom, I'm present. Member Johnson Massad. Here. Member Martini. Here. Chair Proietti. Here. Vice Chair Wall. Here. Mayor Meeks. Mayor Weir. Here. We are all present and we have a quorum. <laughs> Sorry, Vice Chair Wall. I'm going to give you more room next time for that. Uh, just so everyone is aware of how the uh, the order will go tonight, how we'll proceed through specifically the, the budget hearing, um, we will have a uh, We'll open the hearing and we'll have the superintendent do her budget presentation uh, based on where we're all sitting. Uh, folks may from the school committee may want to move into the tables in the audience uh, so they can see the presentation. After the presentation from the superintendent, we'll take public comment and then we will have uh, a motion from the school committee followed by discussion and a vote. And we will then close the budget hearing and do our two other items of business that are on the agenda for the evening before we adjourn, such as hopefully to um, help folks understand how we'll move through it. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, take a motion to open the uh, FY23 budget public hearing for the Greenfield Public Schools. So moved. That was second. the mayor and a second from Member Johnson Musad. And we'll do a vote. Are there any abstentions from opening the hearing? Any no votes for opening the hearing? So we're unanimously opening the hearing. And we'll have the superintendent start right, uh, right away with the presentation. The yes, we will move so we can all see. Thank you. <laughs> I think I'm going to. It's okay. We're creating trip hazards. Okay, good evening. Thank you. Um, I am pleased to present the superintendent's FY23 budget request. So beginning with an overview of the budget priorities that I looked to focus on during the creation of the superintendent's budget proposal. First is building a strong foundation for both sides of our mass tiered system of support triangle the social, emotional, and the academic. So the triangle that we reference is a graphic often used to show how supports are provided in districts, starting with the widest portion of the triangle being the base and looking to support the vast majority, generally discussed of about 80% of our students with a strong core curriculum for academics and social, emotional, behavioral learning. And then as the triangle goes up into more narrow point, it identifies services that are provided for students that require more intensive and individualized services. So that's a graphic and a model that we use when we talk about um, our core curriculum at the base and then tiered supports as we move through. We also focused on creating consistency and continuity across and between buildings. This is not just related to curriculum, although it is primarily with our three elementary schools, but also our social emotional approach, our behavioral expectations. That is an area of focus for the budget for next year. Identifying purchasing and providing training in high quality instructional materials. You've heard a lot of this work from uh, Karen Patnode about the work that's been done with our coaches primarily in English language arts. And we have some math curriculum work happening in this regard at the elementary level as well. 
We are committing resources to writing our curriculum for both sides of the triangle, from academics to our social emotional learning, providing embedded PD, so professional development that happens on an ongoing basis in a variety of formats across the district, not just a speaker that comes in on one isolated day and then doesn't return to support the, the work that has been started and then assessing and providing essential resources for staff and students that's a little bit broader but it relates to technology to our facilities um, those are two of the primary areas that we focused on in the superintendent's budget creation so we the administrators, when I say we, I'm referencing the administrative team, um, provided input and talked about services and supports that they felt we needed. And then I took that input and created the superintendent's budget. So we have social emotional supports for students, including working on curriculum for the next upcoming year, maintaining our increased staffing and ongoing professional development with our trauma-informed care and the work we're doing with the Collaborative for Educational Services. We have an equity focus on our resources, curriculum, and professional development. Work with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to improve uh, our two schools that have been identifying as having academic needs in um, our middle school and Federal Street School. Also working on the Rethinking Discipline Initiative for the middle school and high school, and assessing and improving academic programming across the district while we look at that triangle that we referenced, the mass tiered system of support as the framework. Okay. So in terms of how I prioritize the budget to support social emotional learning, we have increased our social work and school adjustment counseling staff this year, so we're looking to maintain an increase in that support. We did add a director of behavioral services position this school year. We've not been able to fill it, but we are looking to maintain that position and certainly optimistic about filling it in the budget for next year. We are funding the writing of social emotional curriculum. That's something that has been um, posted for staff and we're looking to increase the number of staff who are able to participate. Continuing our professional development with Dr. Lourdes Alvarez Ortiz on trauma informed care from an asset based perspective. Working with the social justice and equity specialists from CES to um, guide our race and equity work and also to maintain the newly created social justice and equity coordinator and providing additional support to our mental health counseling staff regarding a variety of clinical um, topics. So those are some of the ways that we're supporting that priority in the FY23 proposal. Recap. Okay. In terms of supporting the academic side of that MTSS triangle, this year the coach intervention positions were added for middle school and, high sc and um, elementary school, which we would continue in the budget. Our work with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed for uh, work on high quality curriculum materials, that's one of the key steps in improving our curriculum is identifying resources that best meet the needs of our students, but those are costly to provide, especially when we're talking about ensuring students across the district have the, the resources that they need. We have streamlined the use of online resources for academic support. We will be purchasing high quality math materials that are currently being piloted um, and utilized at the elementary. We need to um, ensure we have the appropriate materials for all of our staff across elementary through middle. We have to identify and purchase an ELA, English Language Arts Intervention resources for use across all three schools at the elementary level and then middle and high schools. 
We are funding our instructional leadership team stipends for middle school and high school. That's part of the work that they're doing because of their identification by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And the SSOS is, I just forgot. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Statewide Systems of Support. Sorry, too many letters in my budget presentation. Um, we have built in the purchase of necessary instructional supplies into the local budget. Um, those have not always been included in the budget and instead in some areas we're dependent on fundraising or parent donations to provide. We are, as you have heard, going through an audit of our libraries starting at the elementary level and when we weed out books that are old or damaged, we need to replace them with the lens of relevant various reading levels and ensuring that they represent diverse, um, diverse topics and diverse cultures. So we will be uh, looking to purchase library books. We are including two positions at the high school one, to increase the numbers of sections in PE and health to allow our students to meet graduation requirements. Right now we have high um, class sizes in some areas. And then also to increase elective offerings. So our thinking is that if we are able to increase the elective, which right now our thinking would be to refill a manufacturing position that was eliminated from the budget a few years ago, that we will be able to take advantage of the conversations that um, Karen, Derek Morrison, our principal, and I are having with the president and some of the staff at GCC about supporting students and increasing workplace skills. So it will also, if we offer an additional elective, potentially reduce the class size numbers also in PE health. Um, so that's a two-pronged request from the high school. And then we need to replace our instructional technology. Um, most, if not all, of our devices will be coming end of life in the next year or two. So we are working to create a survey that would go out to staff to identify what the instructional needs are that we would be trying to meet with technology. And then we would identify an appropriate device that will meet all of our needs from the technology standpoint, being fiscally responsible to purchase, and then also meeting all, as many of the academic needs as we can. But we do need to make a decision about that um, prior to our devices being non-functional. We also have to replace things that were lost or broken during remote learning. So. We also have some increases or changes in our special education budgeting. We are proposing two additional teaching positions in special education, one at the middle school and one at the high school. These are to meet identified needs of our students. We have an increase in tuition costs reflected in the budget, and that is um, directly related to individual student programming needs. One of the things that we've worked with Janet on is to um, look at five-year trends, with last year being somewhat of an anomaly, but to look at our trends and to reflect expenditure lines more accurately based on the trends that we've seen we would look to maintain a second educational team leader position in the budget, which was in the budget this year, but not filled for the bulk of the academic year. We are continuing to work on ongoing assessment of all of our programming, and then to provide specialized training for most of our special education teachers throughout the district in some in math, supports and others in EL, English language arts, reading instruction. Okay, now comes the fun part. So in terms of the numbers, you can see if you look at the 
top lines, the FY23 compared to the lower section last, well, this current year's budget. I'll explain all funds is the way that we reference using local funded money from the city or and grants, school choice, circuit breaker, all of our revenues. So when you put all of those sources in together, that's how we reference all funds. But the second number is the local appropriation, meaning what we're, what I'm asking you um, to request from the city. So if you look at the full budget and consider all sources of revenue, we would be looking at approximately a 16% increase. And if you just look at the local request, it is a 7.72%. So I can talk a little bit about the bulk of what makes up that request. One of the biggest pieces that I know the school committee has talked about frequently since I've been here is that our um, staff salaries are not as competitive as some of the other school districts around us. And a few years ago, there was a um, collective bargaining agreement settled and the retroactive payments were addressed through the school choice fund. But this FY23 budget is the culmination of those salary increases for the first time built into the budget. And we also have step increases, meaning people who've worked an additional year in the district and would get a salary increase by virtue of being here the additional year. It also includes any known degree changes. So um, for our teaching staff, if they bump up to a number of credits after their bachelor's degree or after their master's degree, or if they attain a doctorate, either a PhD or an educational doctorate, there are different categories on the salary scale. So some staff have attained a new level of education. So all of those factors that are known to us at the time that this budget was created are built in. And you'll see that is a bulk, um, just over half of this increase is related to salaries. We also had some hires um, from people who've left the district. We had some people who were hired at a different salary step, which affected some of the salary numbers as well. Um, so that's a, that's a bulk of the increase. We also see some increase in contractual services, some increase in the cost of goods and services for our facilities, um, some increases in the products that we're using online. For example, our um, online academic resources, our map testing, things like that, the contracts um, in some cases have increased. So those are some of the factors that resulted in that 7.72. I forget anything. Oh, okay. So last year's or this this current year, I'm trying to finish the year. Um, this current year's local appropriation was 19.7 million dollars, and the request in this budget would be a bump up to 21.2 estimated can obviously see the exact request. So we've broken it down by cost center so you can see where the bulk of the change has occurred. I will say in some of these cost centers, some of what you're gonna see is that we've actually tried to move staff and adjust the budget to reflect where staff were funded or were working at the time of the budget creation. Um, there were some identification of staff in particular areas where they were not housed anymore or they've been a split position and they no longer are, things like that. So um, Andy and Loretta and I have worked to try to identify as best we could where exactly people were charged. So you'll see some adjustments um, in the salary line to reflect actual change in the line, not necessarily a change in the staff. There was still funding identified in Green River, so that was moved into other lines, like some portion of that is um, some technology that needs to be functioning over there at this point, so that's been reallocated. So I can go through a little bit, but I think that you'll see um, 
you know, some increases and decreases primarily are in salary. We're leveraging grants to might show that some of the grants apply to. Thank you. Andy's reminding me that we are utilizing some grant funding to offset this, which certainly we are. So some of the um, funding is being used by with grants to pay for these increases in view. I just want to say, if I, we're not, you know, some people might be concerned when they see reductions or less of an increase. When you look at the all funds to all funds, you'll see us leveraging the grant and our special revenue funds to target appropriately where it is that the needs based budget as presented by the superintendent went. So it's just a matter of the use of the supplemental funding sources we have available to us. This is just strict local to local. Okay. So um, I'm trying to think if there's any, anything substantive at the high school. Um, again, that's reflective of at least two staffing positions that have been added in. Um, the middle school, there is a um, proposal for the increase of a library media specialist, but that is being looked at from um, one of our grants. So I'll move on to the other, fun, the other cost centers. One of the things that you'll see in district curriculum and instruction, that's pretty um, a good example of some of the moves that have been made. Some of the costs that come out of the curriculum and instruction line have been either reflected in some of the individual buildings, such as uh, some of our online academic resources, or there have been things that have been paid out of the technology budget that really are more instructionally related. So they have been moved into the curriculum and instruction line. So that's one good example of where you see some movement to reflect actually where the oversight and expenditure are. Remainder of these are really connected to the salary increases or increases in supplies and materials. Again, some of the special education, as I shared earlier, were showing an increase in tuition in the budget, but there's not a significant increase here because this is local to local increase and we are utilizing um, grant revenue and school choice, um, pardon me, circuit breaker for a number of our tuition costs and we've reallocated the grants in terms of planning for next year. Um, and put more of the contracted services into the local and used more of the grants for tuition. It's not necessarily a huge change in the, co in the money in the grant, but what it does is streamline how we monitor and expend the grants by keeping a bulk of it into one spending category instead of having it split out over a, a number of different areas. So you see the summary. of what we're looking at for the 1.5%, um, I apologize, $1.5 million increase um, in the local request, which is a 7.72%. This is just a summary of some of the funding that we'll be planning to use in the FY23 budget. You'll see, especially in the ESER grants, those are not the totals that we've been awarded, but um, we have looked at how best to allocate the funds to get the most that we can for the staff and students over the entirety of all the grant periods. Um, we also have some resources in the grants that have not yet been allocated, such as the full technology cost. So some of that could be reflected um, as we actually make a decision about what the technology will be. But this is what we have identified as offsetting revenue from grants for next year. Now these are estimates on some of the grants. We'll need to wait. The federal grant period is actually October through September 30th. So, um, but this is best 
you know, best estimate at this point based on what we know. Again, some additional revenue. You can see we're looking to use just over $6 million in grants and other revenue sources. So when we look at all that, I know 7% can seem like a significant amount of a budget increase, but some of the priorities that we are looking to fund, as I shared, is we need to support our social emotional learning and our academic resources for all of our students along the continuum from enhancing and um, growing our core academic and social emotional learning instruction and resources all the way through providing academic and social emotional interventions for our students who may struggle. We need to create that consistency and have the same curriculum expectations across all of our elementary schools and a continuous program up through the middle school and high school, which is something the committee talked about during my interview, is wanting to have consistency across the elementaries. Um, we are continuing our training for academic and trauma-informed care and race and equity in the district, which are areas that we know we need to have a significant focus on. We, we need to establish written curriculum for all of our staff, academic and social emotional, so that we have consistent instruction and focus on standards and resources available for our staff, regardless of what grade level, so that they can teach what we're asking them to teach and have appropriate resources. Continuing that embedded ongoing support for our staff so that they can do for our students what they are looking to do, what they've told us that they want to focus on, and then continuing to ensure that our buildings are addressed and repairs are made and upgrades are taken care of and that we have technology sufficient to meet most of our instructional needs as we go forward. So that is the, a summary of the superintendent's proposed budget. Thank you, Superintendent Barge. Thank you for also keeping it concise. I appreciate that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we as a committee will have a chance for discussion and questions of the superintendent, uh, but we are going to actually have public comment happen um, now first. And uh, I'm assuming, Susan Farber, do you have a list? Okay. So as per usual with public comment, you will have three minutes. When you first start, state your name and the town you live in. You want me to time them? Give me one Good evening. second. Um, give me Doug one Selwyn. second, Doug. I Doug, give me one Greenfield. second. Hang on. What? I, left my phone I take it all back. Me has to do it. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry about that. My time starting now. Yes. Okay, Doug Selwyn, Greenfield. Um, once again, it seems to me that the district is having to do the impossible, which is to deal with all of the needs that you have and nowhere near the money to do it. So I wanna talk about one specific about this, this funding and then to talk a little bit about a wider picture. Um, I'm really concerned about the ratio of teachers and IAs in middle school classrooms, especially where there's one teacher and a lot of kids with needs and no instructional assistance because we don't have them. And I think that's really troubling for a lot of reasons. Um, no kids are getting what they need in that room or not enough um, because the teacher can't possibly meet the needs of many kids with whatever needs they bring um, alone. And what I've heard is that we can't find IAs who are willing to work. 
Um, what I would like to suggest is the other end of that sentence, and we've seen this in other places too, which is we're not finding people who are willing to work with what we're willing to pay them. Um, I think if we want good folks to come into our schools, we have to be willing to pay what it costs. And what we're asking of our IAs and what we're willing to pay them doesn't match. So thinking about how can we think about our priorities differently and put what the needs of the classrooms are way up and maybe find something else to push a little bit farther down. I know it's a magic trick, you know, look over here and I'm doing this over here. Um, but I think it's really important that we, we recognize that we're losing staff, we're losing um, students um, because people are not getting what they need in the classroom and that, um, that's troubling. And, and I know the people in the schools are working as hard as they can, so this is not a slight on them. It's just we're asking them to do more than they possibly have the resources to do. So that's my narrow um, thing. My, my wider thing is to recognize we need more money. Where can that come from? Well, I've got three suggestions that are wider than this year's budget. One is the fair share amendment, which is coming up for a vote in November, and will produce $2 billion of additional revenue for the state by taxing people over $1 million, um, a 4% surcharge, and it's on the ballot. We just need to get people to come out and vote for it, recognizing that money's gonna go to education and transportation. The second is recognizing someday that single-payer insurance, we had somebody from the, the Association of School Committees come out a few years ago and give a presentation about how the insurance costs for meeting the needs of special ed is way, 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 way larger than what it's budgeted, which means we're in trouble that way. It's my time up. The third is get rid of the MCAS. A lot of money goes there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, you have three minutes. Name and town first. Hi, I'm Dawn Morin and I am from Greenfield. Um, while we talk about priorities, I just want to bring up a couple of priorities we should be adding to the list for the Greenfield school system. And one of them is, is transparency. Um, last week, um, at last week's meeting, Glenn was given a hard time for suggesting that all subcommittee meetings, budget subcommittee meetings be recorded. Um, first off, the way that member Ekstrom, excuse me if I pronounced that wrong, spoke to Glenn for reaching out to GCTV about recording the meetings was uncalled for. Um, anyone is allowed to record meetings. My son has recorded several town meetings for me. Um, and so I'm not really sure, I mean, I didn't understand why she or anyone else on the committee thinks the school committee has the authority to make a policy that says otherwise. And I just want to let you know now, from here on in, my son or I, if no one is available to record those subcommittee meetings, those budget subcommittee meetings, he will be here to record or I will. And I don't want any trouble from the committee when he shows up with his camera. And speaking of uncalled for behavior, I find it very unsettling that the number of times I've watched a meeting and I heard and saw the way Ekstrom and Pri I'm sorry, Amy, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, so I'm gonna to refer to you as Amy, spoke to other members. You are all supposed to be collaborating together on agenda items to make the best decision for our kids. Instead of having a mature discussion and being respectful to each other, it's like watching a movie with mean girls. And trust me, my son tells me that I need to work on my tone, so I'm guilty, so I get it. I do. But self-awareness is the first step, and I am working on it. And I suggest that you guys go back and watch the meetings and the videos and take note of your behavior and see where you can change it so that you can be more productive as a group. And I hope those that are spoken to the way that you're spoken to by a couple of these members on here will start finding your voice and standing up for yourself. You were part of this group and you were voted in to make a change because people didn't like the way they were doing things before. So please, start finding your voice. This is not the Amy and Susan show. Thank you.
Any more public comment? Yes, Mike, followed by Ellen Thompson. Thank you. 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 Thank
debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, wide open, and that it may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public servants. The bottom line is, well, the court argued that the common law standard would result in a rule compelling the critic of official conduct to guarantee the truth of all his factual assertions and to do so on pain of libel judgments. Virtually unlimited in amount leads to self-censorship. Instead, the court put into place a more rigorous standard necessary for sustaining the maintenance of the opportunity for free political discussion, a fundamental principle of our constitutional system that is essential to the security of the republic. We, the people, do not have to be nice to any of you if the situation calls for plain, unvarnished language. Grow up and get on with it. Anyone else for public comment? All right. Great. Go ahead. Good evening. Andrew Vernon, Greenfield, Massachusetts. So first of all, to the superintendent, thank you for the, the, the additional monies for technology. Uh, in my humble opinion, Greenfield Public Schools has not invested enough monies. I used a very critical term called end of life, which I think is terribly important to understand and appreciate that end of life of technology means end of life. It's very important that technology should be replaced proactively and not and more aggressively rather than waiting for terms such as end of life. Uh, I encourage you to look at the percentage of technology in the overall GPS budget. Uh, that's my comment about technology and again I very much appreciate that and I've been waiting seven years to hear that in Greenfield. So thank you Superintendent. Uh, as to the some of the other individuals who have commented, uh, I make my comments similarly in support uh, meetings are public, period, end of story. There is no force of law that disallows anyone from recording them, taping them, or otherwise. GCTV is not a member of Greenfield government or the school system. They are a nonprofit that sits outside of city government. Disallowing them to attend a meeting violates the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. They are free press and they are welcome and should be encouraged to attend all public meetings if they are able and so choose. If peg monies are not available to them to do that, I would strongly encourage the mayor by way of Comcast and the 10 year contract with Comcast and the city of Greenfield to make more peg funds available so that individuals from GCTV are able to better staff meetings such as all public meetings. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more public comment. Go ahead. Just state your name and your town. You have three minutes. Yes, my name is Donna Festinger from Greenfield. Um, I'm a bit concerned about the enormous increase in the budget. Um, uh, people that live in Greenfield are having a hard time with the taxes as is. I'm also curious as to learn more about the social and emotional education, what exactly you're talking about and what that increase entails. Um, I'd like to know where I could learn more about exactly the specifics of what you're talking about. Um, so those are my concerns. I think the budget is enormous as it is, and to ask for another one million plus, um, and making a big emphasis on the social and emotional needs of students, I would prefer to see the students learning math, science, reading, academics. Um, I think that's where uh, the, the social and emotional education could take place at home or at church and other areas. I know that students do need some um, instruction in that, of course, but I'm curious as to what that entails. Um, 
I realize this is just a comment time, but I would like to know where I could find that out, more specifics about what that spending, because you're asking for another huge increase in that. So I'm just curious on what that exactly entails. And you're talking about equity. What exactly are you talking about with equity? I'm concerned because I've done a lot of reading lately about some of the things that are included in equity. And um, it's a little fuzzy. And it seems to me that the, some uh, school districts, the children are getting indoctrinated uh, in things that the parents don't especially want them to be learning at school. They could, you know, the parents could be teaching the children what they want them to learn. So I'm just curious of where I could find out more information about that. Thank you. Any further public comment? Anybody? Okay, thank you all. At this point, um, I would ask for a motion to accept the FY23 superintendent's budget as presented. So move. Second. <laughs> that was a, a motion from Vice Chair Wall and a second from Member Johnson Musad. And we'll move right into discussion. Um, the way I think we can best organize it um, is to actually go through the budget packet um, by cost center and just to make sure folks we're all on the same page the cost centers that's gray right that's gray yeah, yeah. thank you I always doubt myself when it's gray I thought maybe it was blue okay uh, we'll go through by cost center, and then obviously, if you have questions left over at the end, we'll discuss them then. If questions come up in within, um, that's totally fine. Um, and uh, questions can be addressed to the superintendent or uh, ASKP or uh, Mr. Paquette. Mostly Mr. Paquette is what I'm told. He's the brains behind the operation. Andy and I'll tag team on this. So if you just ask the question, one sure. of us will take it. Okay. I'd like to say I'm the rose between two thorns here. <laughs> so. Every rose. Yep. Uh, okay. He, he does um, want to say that. So the first cost centers we've got undefined and central office on page four. Any uh, question? Are we in the wrong place? There's stumbled no. weird. The, the, the page numbers. Don't oh, make any sense. you are right. Okay, I hold on. I apologize. The packets that were copied for you for last week were in page number. Th they're not exactly in the so right order. So I apologize. Order. You can ask these in any order that you would like. Well, I will follow along. Okay. So um, do we want to put them office. in page number order before no, we get started? I don't started? think you'll be able to do that. I tried. Well, <laughs> okay, so I'm guessing they're all stapled similarly, maybe not. Okay, so if I start with North, North Parish, Christine, is that yes. what you have? Yes, it is. How about the rest of the committee? If I start with North Parish, is that going to cause you issues? Page number. Page number. Oh, number one. one. <laughs> I briefly looked at my packet and didn't find number one. So I can explain what happened. I had yes. originally numbered them. Yeah. And then when we were going to put them onto the website, I named the files. And when they saved in the folder, they alphabetized. <laughs> so. Okay. So. Is the committee prepared to start with page one in North Parish? Do you want a couple of minutes to get get settled? It says page one on the bottom. It does. If you um, actually look at the bottom gray bar yeah. under yeah. at the bottom, yeah. it will have the name, the full name of the cost center. On a couple pages, there's more than one, but the title of the location that we're talking about the funding will always be located in a solid gray bar across the length of the um, spreadsheet any questions about North Parish 
And we can, of course, go back if people get confused. I'm now on to page two, and we've got Federal Street. And of course, if you have questions about Green River, specifically related to the budget, let's not open a can of worms. Um, I would take those. Any Federal Street or Green River questions? I guess I have a Green River question. So it just is, it's, there's no line items at all related to Green River. Correct. The only thing that's reflected there is we had some technology expenditure to keep some systems in the building running. Yep. Well, technically the line was listed as English language learners, but since it's not used for education, it was just moved to okay. the appropriate line. Thank you. Um, I wait. I yes, go ahead. Please, go ahead. Um, how are we keeping the heat on? I assume there we is an assist on. Yes, there. but that, those expenses are on the city side. I the city has maintenance expenses related to the schools. So, That's fine. Yep. Currently, there's no heating system in oh. Green River. <laughs> Just in case you hadn't heard oh, that. No, I did not. Um, <laughs> yes, please. Member Johnson Musan. So where where is that Green River technology that you were just discussing? It's embedded in the IT costs. Oh, okay. District-wide um, cost. Did you have a question? Anyone else on Green River? Yeah. I had one actually on um, Federal Street. So Go ahead. Um, I know that you had made the differentiation between what's being requested from local appropriation versus what's being provided through grants and other sources. But, sorry, can you not hear me? Um, but um, it's pretty noticeable the difference in terms of an increase for Federal Street being 1% con in comparison to other schools throughout. And so I was wondering if you could just elucidate that a little bit more for people, especially since Federal Street is one of our turnaround schools. The bulk of change in the schools, like Newton, um, North Parish, I apologize, actually had a decrease of 5% overall. Um, yes, federal was a 1% increase. Four corners um, shows about a 10%. Some of that is just the reallocation of where staff is actually working versus where they had been charged prior. So for example, Newton School, we hired our new music teacher, our band teacher this year, and his salary is allocated at Newton. He works at all the elementaries, but that's where the cost is reflected. So Newton will have an increase that's actually a little bit higher than um, some of the other buildings because he's um, located there in terms of a budgetary expense. So. Um, Generally, the costs for salary reflect either hiring people that were at a higher salary than the person who vacated the position prior or funding, putting the funding in the building where they actually are located. Anyone else have questions for the schools we've already gone through? North Parish. I do. Go ahead. Uh, Mary I Dwayne. guess. <laughs> um, I still wonder, and I think that might be what Member Mariani was looking for, but I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to put words into her mouth. Why is there, um, it probably has to do with enrollment and many other things, um, why is there such a significant uh, difference between, say, Four Corners and Federal Street in terms of the percent increase? Go ahead. I was looking at the number. I, I realize I'm looking at an aggregate number that sure. could include sure. lots you, of things. So one of the things, that, and, and it dovetails with the discussion that was made about the work we did regarding aligning the staff to where they are. So the, there's things, for example, if you look at in the detail of Four Corners, there was uh, there's an increase in the special education staff at Four Corners. So that's where a person was at a different place moved there. So it is, as you say, Mayor, could be a combination of enrollment driven, needs driven as to where personnel are and reallocated. I will say that when we did the budget as with the budget subcommittee, you know, and the process has always been, 
we have the these are the in a sense of the needs based that were presented to us by the administrators so although it might look like some are getting for lack of a better phrase the short end of the stick <laughs> um rest assured that the needs that were brought forward by the administration are reflected in what's being presented here so it's uh, you know the devil being in the details the numbers kind of might skewer what it looks like when in actuality mm -hmm. the needs as presented by them are reflected in what we're looking at okay thank you. thank you okay uh we were at four corners it looks like we've covered those couple of pages and that was page three and page four is newton i don't think we've yet talked about newton at all are there questions about Newton, sorry about the microphone. I'm not hearing any. Oh, there are it, there are two page fours. Has everyone found it? Um, yeah. Newton, okay. That's fine. And if you if you come across the middle school or the high school, you can save those because they'll be up next. <laughs> Newton's on the back of page one. I got it. All right. Any questions about Newton? I'm not seeing any. We'll move on to Greenfield Middle. Questions about Greenfield Middle School and the budget? I'm not hearing any. What about the high school and the budget? We, that would be page seven from the February 14th, yeah. Any questions about high school? I, go ahead, please. I don't know if this is too general. Member Denise, please go ahead. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, you're looking to add two special education professionals? Was that, uh, that's what I got from the slides, correct? There's two special education positions, one at middle school, one at high school, okay. and then the proposal was to add two general education staff to the high school for the electives. So okay. there was two different numbers that were talked about. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that that was for middle school and for the high school. Special ed was one in each building. Okay, because we've had so many people come and talk specifically to me about IEPs not being met. When we hired them, is that enough to start to work on that sort of thing? So we make adjustments to staffing to meet individual student needs based on IEPs, and those needs come from a meeting that's held by the student's mm -hmm. educational team. So as those teams meet and make determinations, um, we make adjustments in our staffing. The other piece related to some of our special education staff is work that we do in terms of supporting students comes with the scheduling of the building um, and students who may receive support in a general ed classroom setting with support from either an IA or a special education teacher. And then the other place that we have special education staff is in some of our highly specialized programs. And so we look at all of those factors when we look at the needs. So what I can say is that on the day I said, okay, this is it. This is the superintendent's budget proposal for next year. <laughs> Adding those two staffing positions would meet our needs on that day. But special education along with the general budget, but special education more than anything moves almost daily. Mm -hmm. So as we go through the remainder of the year, you know, those are things that Andy and I and Janet will continue to monitor and make adjustments to. But on the day that we said, that's it, yes, to the best of my knowledge, adding those two positions would have met the unmet needs we had at that time. That means for positions, that doesn't mean every position that we have had was filled on that day, but it's the um, presence of a position in the district or in the budget. Okay. Th Does that answer? That makes sense. I just, I hope that parents are tuning in to this and mm -hmm. taking in as much of it, um, as much as they can of it, because mm -hmm. that's a big problem, I know. Hmm. I have a question, or two. Mayor Rita Gardner, go ahead. 
I, I'm curious about, and I may not have a problem with it because there's probably an explanation, excuse me, uh, but there's a 177% increase in the athletic supplies for the high school. <laughs> that was yes. significant. Well, uh, especially as it relates to the 0% increase in instructional supplies. Well, um, yes, because one of the things that we had to reflect was one, the running of a full season next year. Mm -hmm. And also, Coach K did make some requests for uniform replacements. Mm -hmm. So that it's also not the highest budget line in the high school budget. So once you hit a certain threshold, the percentage begins to look rather substantial, even though if the um, true dollar amount is not as frightening as that would no, suggest. No, it wasn't. <laughs> right. But given how low it was in 22. <laughs> I think it's very fair to say that the Greenfield Education Foundation has been very generous to our athletic program in the past. Yeah. Um, which they may choose to continue to be. But when we, when I sought um, our needs from our mm -hmm. department heads, um, that was one of the needs that was shared. Now, can you explain why there's, <clears throat> excuse me, no in increase in instructional supplies? Is that they were all set? <laughs> it's a combination of, again, the discussions we had with administration, but also what we've done. Uh, we did a four-year trend analysis of expenditures pre the past two years to look and see what the trends were in expenditures of all the lines and that was used to guide what it is that uh the administration were looking at for their request to see you know between what was budgeted versus what the actual trends were in expenditures and then that was used as far as a guide guidepost if you will for what it is that they are looking for mm -hmm. in addition i will say dr dubarge is uh, frugal and would tell and sitting in on some of the meetings tell them to go back and you know get the cheaper pencils and Kleenex if you will and stuff of those you know to that level where we are down all kidding aside it was to that level of discussion we had with them to really get the administration aware maybe more so than they might have in the past as to what it is that they spent their dollars on and that's not a criticism that's just mm -hmm. the nature of education finance and budgeting in this day and age so it was based primarily on trend analysis long answer my apologies i can relate <laughs> to cheaper pencils and double-sided printing i think <laughs> that we as an administrative team are really looking at ways that we can get what our staff and students need in and being as fiscally responsible as possible. So I know Andy was a little bit tongue in cheek in terms of <laughs> go find cheaper pencils, but I think a new perspective in the district is um, a nice way to ask questions about things that have been practice and in some cases that led to decisions about ways that we could do things differently so but i do take management and oversight of the budget as one of my <laughs> favorite things I, I say um truthfully so okay. thanks thank you both other questions related to the high school budget okay i'm going to move on We've got the district-wide budget. That is page eight. And after that, curriculum and instruction. That's the other page nine. Mm. Questions about any of those? And on page 10, there's a group, nursing services, superintendent, athletics, and the end of ELL. Any questions about those? I guess I have a question about nursing. Um, 
do you anticipate a reduction in our expenses as we wind down with COVID stuff? At this point, we do. We've had some staffing changes, and so we're able to utilize. We're very fortunate that we were, despite the fact we had a resignation with um, Kelly Savitri, we were able to keep the staffing that we had in place, and that staff um, requested changes in positions. So what we're looking to not have built into next year's budget is an additional float nurse position and also the two health assistants that have done the lion's share of our COVID testing. Um, that was based on information we had at the time that this was finalized. We are continuing to monitor and I will continue to monitor, but you know, watching trends change, that's what our hope is for next year. I mean, that's what I expect. I didn't think you'd have some surprise answer, so thank you. Any other questions on this page? It's page 10. It's got superintendent, nursing, athletics, and ELL. I do. Sure, go ahead, Member Martini. Um, could you talk about the decrease in substitutes? That was based on the trend analysis that Andy referenced, that even this obviously last year was not an indication of substitutes, um, but even taking in years prior to March of 20, um, we have been trending lower in sub costs than what had been budgeted. So we made the adjustment um, based on that trend. Is that because of fewer requests for substitutes or because it's been more difficult to find substitutes? I don't know what would have driven the sub costs prior. Um, I don't know if you have. I would just say it's uh, probably a combination of factors in the sense of it's difficult to get subs. Um, it could very well be that there were times that the, the subs weren't needed. Uh, sub, uh, the substitute budgeting in schools is almost similar to, I'll say, like budgeting for heating is it's, it's you know, for lack of a better phrase, almost a crapshoot. You know, you get a good year, fine, but then, you know, I've, some of our other clients have had, you know, several maternity leaves that end up blowing your sub budget out or for various reasons or what have you. So, um, you know, we were, we were just going on based on the trends of what we looked at prior to the last two years. Um, and there's the possibility may exist if we have a difficult year that you'll see a budget transfer come, you know, say in FY23 to have us up up that if we look to start to see trends going over. But just looking at the trends of what budgeted to actual have been for the four previous years pre-COVID, we never exceeded what was budgeted. Hence, they were feeling comfortable that we could take this reduction. Any other questions there? Chair Poetti? Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Did we miss curriculum instruction? Did I miss it or have we not gotten there yet? I think I think it was on the page previous. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, the only question I had was on the line item for staff development. Um, I, 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 taking note of the 135K plus uh, for from all funds, a reduction in local, and is this... Um, is this funded by grants? What do you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You're good, Mayor Ritter Gardner. I'm good. Okay. And so we are looking at, I think, administrative technology and system wide um, expenses. That's page 11, followed by special ed on page 12. No questions on any of those. I am. Um, I have a big picture question. Um, I, I think I'm going to try to answer it myself. <laughs> How about that? Okay. So we talk um, maybe not as much uh, as a, as as agenda items. Or maybe not as much as we should, but. Certainly, there's discussion about the cost for our out of district placements that goes on. Um, and, you know, in looking at your presentation and what we've tried to do with special ed over the past year, um, as 
as we fill the positions that are vacant, mm -hmm. which you seemed optimistic about in the new hiring season, unless I misinterpreted your optimism. I am optimistic. Okay. It, do you see that increased capacity in the department in special ed helping us to build a bridge to bringing some of those out of district placements back? That is my goal. Um, between the ongoing assessment that um, Janet and I are partnering on that I referenced in the presentation, the new staff positions primarily at the high school and the um, position the director of behavioral services, we are really striving to strengthen and expand the offerings that we have in district to support our students so that we can provide the best free and appropriate education in district so that students have the ability to be with their peers in their home school to the greatest extent possible. Um, I think what we need to just establish is that it's a process. It's not an overnight change and there's a lot that goes into developing specialized programs for students, but that is something that we are beginning to build and the hope being that we increase our internal capacity across all of the areas, including some of our consulting. We've had some fantastic consultants, but it's always better in my opinion um, and in my experience as a special ed director to have internal capacity so the resources available more frequently, more readily. So that is the goal, to be able to um, increase our programming options. Thank you. Other questions about those categories? We had administrative technology, um, system-wide, special ed. 504 is the next one that's up. Is it normal to have a reduction like that in 504 services? I think it's... 504 is based on student need. Yeah. And so it's Just really an anomaly, a maybe. Flu fluctuation looking at trends of things where um, services are more accurately reflected. So it certainly does not reflect a move away from providing right. services that are needed. It's just the reflecting them budgetarily where they go. Thank you. Um, next up, we've got custodial and maintenance, transportation. I have a transportation Please. question. Okay. Um, once upon a time, not so long ago, we had many, many vans. Do we still have many, many vans? We have. And I don't mean many. M I N I. I mean multiple. We vans. have. We have <laughs> many minivans. Yes. So <laughs> well, that, yeah, that too. Yes. We do. Um, we do the bulk of our specialized in district transportation yeah. and um, transporting students to some of the specialized programs outside of Greenfield, and then supporting transportation needs for students who are identified as homeless. Um, so we do have a fairly robust transportation system with our many minivans. Okay, I was good to know. I just wanted to make sure they were getting used. Oh, most definitely. Yeah, and um, and Kuzmeskis is doing the rest. Yeah. Yes, Kuzmeskis is doing the um, general transportation. Right, okay. thank you. Member Johnson Musa, go ahead. But I guess following up on the mayor's question, I felt like we, uh, a couple of years ago, approved purchases of vans with the intent not just of providing transportation in district, but also providing it <clears throat> further. And have we found that we just needed those vans for our own needs, or do we have more capacity than we need in terms of vans? Mm -hmm. So we are um, supporting transportation needs for some other local districts. Um, I think Andy can probably speak a little bit more to the bigger picture of our in-district transportation. I know that he was 
he's been more involved in that discussion. So um, short, we are doing some transportation for some other local districts, but I think he can respond on the grander level to that discussion. Yes, yeah, so when uh, there was a proposal that was put forth when the, the vans were, were purchased about doing our own, both in and out of district, as well as being able to provide services to the sur some surrounding districts as far as almost being a vendor to them. Uh, with the goal that this would all end up being for, you know, budget neutral, uh, we haven't reached budget neutrality yet, honestly. Um, you know, and that may be, I mean, the past two years would be an unfair, you know, look at that but you know hopefully going forward as we do that but as the transportation needs in the district have been you know evaluated as far as what it is that we even have the capacity to do um, that gets evaluated and we end up having to in a sense for lack of a better phrase take care of our own needs first before we're able to even contract out and provide services to others we are exploring options with other districts about the possibility of entering agreements with them where we would potentially increase our capacity both internally and externally to do that since we have both the staffing the vans and the coordination of it to do that so um we're not there yet you know but it's it's in process and so you know with all the discussions that we've had and every time that we talk about the transportation it is first and foremost meeting our needs first if we have the ability as far as you know expanding on that then we we explore that option Member martini go ahead would you mind if i went back a step to special education. I don't mind at all. Sorry. At this point, we've really gone okay. through all the cost centers, and so I'd open it up to any questions that uh, folks have missed or more general questions or stuff that you just thought of. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to um, just follow up on uh, Chair Poirier's question and your um, comment about um, trying to increase in-district capacity to meet special education needs in the hopes of reducing out-of-district placement. And I was wondering if you have any particular priorities in that. Uh, we have students who attend specialized schools based on widely divergent needs between language-based schools uh, and highly specialized services for students with autism or uh, deaf students and things like that. So I'm just wondering, is there a particular priority that you would like to work on first or um, things that you consider particularly important when you're trying to increase in district capacity? Right now, that's a conversation that we're having in terms of looking at where we anticipate our students um, going between, you know, what types of programs they're attending between now and the end of the school year, where we have the ability to ramp up the most effectively in the shortest amount of time so that we want to be able to build something that um, has an impact for our students as quickly as possible without rushing. <laughs> um, so it's, and to be very blunt, we have to look at the cost effectiveness of where we're building first. Um, I believe that we should have a very robust continuum of services for students. Um, but when we look at what the first choice will be, we have to look at a variety of factors and we're in the process of doing that. Okay. I noticed that uh, the funds for uh, teaching and services in extended year is the same. And I'm just wondering, um, why <laughs> I sort of expect there to be like a little bit of an increase each year but um, there's no change so how do you oh. anticipate that at this point families are I mean it's March so April May June uh, extended school year services are coming pretty shortly and are you talking about specifically in special education yes that's it's here in the special education okay I just wanted to make yes. sure that's what you were specifically referencing mm -hmm. so that is based on information from the budget discussion with Janet Dickinson and what she knew to be the case at the time of this budget conversation and looking at trends and the other thing that Andy's going to tell you about. <laughs> just for the past three years, 
just three years, I'll give you pre-COVID, uh, $29,177 on extended year, 33662 the next year, and then 51836 the following year. So we've never reached that $60,000 extended year budget amount. And so in our discussions with Dr. Dickinson, she felt comfortable that based on what the needs have always been, that at $60,000 a safe number. Thank you. So on the other side of that spectrum, then we have a 1,111% increase in contracted professional services for evaluation. So I understand that we maybe have a um, lack of staff to provide those evaluations in district or? That's if you actually look at the line below that. It's the reflection of that cost on the appropriate line. So the bulk of the money in that 1,000% increase actually was transferred from the line below. From OTPT services? Correct. And it's, it's, when time comes for reporting to the Department of Ed, those two lines are combined into one. You know, there's clear, uh, his, history here has been apparently that they create, um, for lack of a better phrase, a line item for everything. And so the goal has been with the, the, again, working with Dr. Dickinson that, you know, we have the detail of what it is that we're spending on contracted services for evaluations and contracted services for OTPT, but to make it more manageable for the department, the goal is to collapse it, you know, to work to collapse it into one line. So those two, if you take those two together, we're actually looking at a $30,000 increase, $36,000 increase. Okay. I don't really understand how that works in the minds of the Department of Education then, because those seem like widely different things, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> I would never attempt to divine their <laughs> understanding and their rationale for what it is that they do when it comes to expense categorization. But if you were to look at the foundation categories, there is no delineation between these two. It is, falls under the, if you look at the four segments in the 2320, those services fall under that categorization. And could you explain the minus 100%, the total decrease in tutors in special education? That's the line right below sure. that. Go ahead, you're on. That's again, um, tutors are not a specific category. They would be under, under uh, embedded in the paraprofessional instructional assistant line scattered throughout the reporting 2310 is no longer again going that four segment code in 2310 is not a tutor category that's actually a um, instructional coach evaluator category so tutoring it's not like we're not providing tutoring services it's just that it's properly categorized with paraprofessionals where again when time comes to report to the state those get all combined into one so those are throughout paraprofessional lines in the different school buildings, Correct. is what you're saying? Yeah, okay. Last one, I promise. I'm uh, wondering, in regards to the SPED technology supplies, which has a, also a very large increase, what are we investing in there? So that is generally technology for individual students, and that is something that has not necessarily been budgeted to reflect needs in the past. So we are reflecting what is anticipated to be the need based on what we know now. Great, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Member Johnson Musad, go ahead. I have a broad question and or comment, but it seems like um, you, you kind of, I think my brain is kind of wanting to look at the budget and have it tell me a story, but in a way it isn't because of things like this, where it's like, oh yeah, we're moving that line and that's distributed across all the different schools. So I, I guess one question I have is, it seems like in some ways what you're doing is cleaning up the budget and trying to get categories that make sense and are streamlined and align with the state or whatever. 
can we expect in future budgets that it will be kind of easier to, to tell the story or not? I think yes, in a general sense, that is something that we would look for. And to share um, your feeling, that is some of what I went through in building the budget because I would look at lines with, with Andy, with Karen, with the administrators and say, what's in that line? And we'd look at it and say, why in the world would that be there? That's not what that is. So in terms of building and monitoring the budget, if things are not categorized where they belong, so to speak, it makes it challenging to monitor how we're spending because I'm looking at lines that don't reflect what's really the category and saying, well, why would, for example, why do we have all of these tutors? It, it's not an actual example, but why would we have all these tutors? And then we have the conversation. It's like, well, the answer to that question doesn't match sort of the expenditure category. So we cleaning up is a very good um, description. And if I just may add, um, and I'm going to get it maybe real esoteric here, so I apologize in advance. Um, but as to, to some extent, all kidding aside, the story that you're looking for, which is a valid request and what you're looking for, I guess it's like, that's in the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. How that PowerPoint is met, this is the sausage to that story. This, these line items are exactly what it is. If, if you approve and want to approve the superintendent's request as detailed in the PowerPoint, these expenditures and these categories and cost centers meet those goals and initiatives. We would love it, and as Dr. DeBarge is saying, that it's easy to translate from this detail to that story. Um, and it's something that since I've been here and the previous times that we have been here um, has been our goal as well. Other budget questions from the committee? I have. Mayor Rita Gardner, go ahead. I have um, a couple of questions and then a comment. I'll start with the questions. Um, I want to go back to transportation and it's just a gen, it's not on the budget, it, near as I could tell. I just, the, uh, I'm assuming that the fuel costs, the gasoline that you put in the vans and so forth, is on the city side? Yeah, okay. <laughs> you do know it's gone up, but not even a little bit, like a lot. Yeah, so just letting you know that. Um, significantly, just as of re very recently, so it'll affect 22 and 23. Um, the only other thing oh. is, um, I overall, I, I, you mentioned a, f a few new positions here and there. Do you have any idea how many new positions you've, I'm looking at aggregate here, yes. if you know how many new positions you have and do you have an aggregate cost for them? If all four positions material, well, four. Four? <laughs> um, the okay. two, yes, <laughs> I answered for, I'll my go own for question. Four. <laughs> and um, we use a general salary guide to estimate um, a position. So I would have to ask Andy what we generally budget, what we use for a budgeting guideline for a new staff position. It's like a master step four. Yeah, I think it's generally we use like master okay. step four or five in terms of planning purposes okay. and then um, adjust as adjust we go from that there. Way. All right. And my comment is just uh, how refreshing it is to see a budget that um, I've only seen two prior to this one, but to see a budget that was very, very well crafted and with a great deal of thought and I appreciate that, and with an eye towards the bottom line um, as much as you possibly could. So uh, thank you. A, a great deal of appreciation about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you all set? Are you I'm done. OK. Uh, other questions from the school committee about the budget? Member Martini? You know I do. <laughs> um, 
I was wondering if we, there is feedback or, um, or if you expect to have feedback in a certain way from staff about the professional development provided by the district so far and um, what they feel next steps would be or additional training that they feel would be important to account for. So that's a function of Karen's office to get evaluations from staff on the professional development and all of our building administrators work with staff to determine what areas of need they feel that they have. And we also get that information through the evaluation creation process with our certified staff. So that's an ongoing conversation that we have at the administrative level all the time. And maybe related to that, um, I just wanted to um, kind of raise the voice of a lot of um, constituents that have uh, contacted me asking for um, funds specifically devoted to restorative justice practices and after school programming. Uh, so I know you've talked about um, the SEL funds included in this budget, but um, maybe you could elucidate for them more um, about what um, what you're planning for when it comes to that and uh, then after school of course is a separate topic so I'll do after school first because it's faster so the after school we do have um, funds in the budget to reflect stipends for staff with after school planning I have reached out to um, the rec department to have conversations about what possibilities exist there. And we are in the process of having um, planning discussions with the middle school, but some of the factors related to increased after school programming at the middle school or, or high school are related to some of our collective bargaining. So we need to work with um, our unions to establish any of those positions that would be available after school, so we need to go through that process. But we are, um, you know, we recognize the need for students to have activities after school. Um, we're having conversations with the elementary about the potential for some clubs as well being added. So, um, you know, it is a conversation, but we also have to follow some of the process that we have to get that um, discussed and finalized. So in terms of SEL, SEL is a broad term, social emotional learning. Um, for me, when I have that conversation, the building of a restorative philosophy is included in that. So any of our professional development about race and equity is related, working with staff around strategies to support our students who have trauma and using an asset-based approach is related. Creating our social emotional learning curriculum helps to establish basically what tenants we as Greenfield Public Schools believe that we should be helping our students to acquire. Some of those frameworks include self-management, self-awareness, social awareness. So we are really at the beginning of building a climate and a culture in the district that supports a restorative philosophy. Um, we can provide staff with tools about a restorative approach, but I feel that we need to have some discussions and create common agreements and expectations and a curriculum for our students so that we all create the same understanding of how we want to approach our students and quite honestly approach each other. So I can't um, give somebody a book on restorative justice and make them believe it. It's work that we have to undertake and have a lot of conversations about and um, do a lot of work to build in the change that results in using a restorative approach. We have some of those tools in district and we have a lot of staff who've done work around restorative practices and using restorative circles in the past, but with the time away from in-building learning and the changeovers in staff, 
Um, there are gaps in what we believe as a district. And so we're beginning again at the foundational level to ensure that when we talk about what we believe is the Greenfield schools, all of our staff and students and families um, share that same belief. So some of the places it's reflected, the SEL curriculum writing, the director of behavioral services, the equity and community services coordinator, I may not have the whole title of that correct, um, staff that we already have in district, our um, TLC staff, our building monitors that respond to staff, any of the um, staff professional de development that our instructional assistants or our teachers take um, privately on restorative practice. Those are just some of the things that are embedded and quite honestly, our director of behavioral services, whoever joins the district in that position will need to espouse the same beliefs so that when they work with administrators and teachers and families, they're um, using the same philosophy, the same expectations, and the same approaches that we are across the district. That's just some off the top of my head. I'm sure if I combed through, I could find some that additional. That was great, thank you. Okay. Member Martini, are you all set? Um, I just noticed that the volunteer coordinator is no longer um, part of one of the line items in here, and that might touch on um, the ability to provide more after school programming. So I wondered if you could just talk about that and then I'm done. Right now I would say it's actually not because we don't have a huge um, group of people who've come in to complete the paperwork for volunteers. We, have a, we, ha we do have some that have done that um, and then we refer them to the building principal after they've completed their paperwork. Um, at this point, I think, given all the other needs in the district and listening to the department heads, you know, such as IT and, and facilities and all the building administrators, um, looking at the priorities, I would look to handle the coordination of volunteers differently right now out of my office rather than allocate that funding um, right now based on, on the situation that we have currently. Thanks. Any further questions about the budget? I, I have a question, but I did have, go ahead. I did have just a comment. I just wanted to thank you for how you answered Member Martini's question because I often have those questions and I go to the website and I want to read about the social emotional learning. Um, and it just struck me that maybe as the house cleaning gets done in the future, some sort of kernel of this could be put on the website so that parents can go in and soak in this information because I think it's not very readily available and people do ask these questions all the time and it's hard to you know go into the whole thing. Absolutely not only are we doing some of this foundational work um, we're also starting to clean up the website <laughs> which is another piece. Oh thank you um, so much. Yeah. Um, Karen and I again talking today about how we would house um, and share curriculum. That's a whole other piece of the foundation of the structures in the district. So there's a lot of pieces that we're trying to address that we know will make some of this information more accessible as we create it. So a lot of things being built at the same time. So yes, the website is one of those things. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any further questions? So I do need to um, ask for a friendly amendment uh, to our motion for the budget. Um, Susan Farber pointed out that we typically have the budget total that's being proposed as a part of the motion. Um, so I'd like to amend the motion to read, uh, let's see. I move to accept the FY23 superintendent's budget at the total amount of $21,255,213 as presented. Would the, uh, I'm not sure who made the motion, but would you accept the friendly amendment? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay, and I think. I second it and I thank, accept it. Thank you, thank you. Um, so it's a, it seems like we can move to a vote. Everyone Just knows what we're voting on. If I may. Yes, Sorry. maybe not. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Go ahead. Sure. 
Sorry, Susan. Yes, uh, 21 million. Two five five two hundred and fifty five thousand two hundred and thirteen dollars. Thank you. Okay, so we will do. Yeah. Just if I may. Oh, share, I'm sorry. That's okay. No, yeah, it's, Mr. Bickett, I, go ahead. I don't want to prolong this, but I just feel it's uh, it warrants a comment and something that was discussed and shared in a budget finance subcommittee regarding, and it was in Dr. DeBarge's comments on a presentation that. What is reflected here, I know, you know, some people might have the, the standard sticker shock of a 7.72% increase. However, when you take into consideration the fact that this compounds two years of negotiated raises that have been settled and are now reflected going forward, those two years of raises were $649,000 that were taken out of the schools and that's appropriately so. The funds are there. So it was taken out of the school reserve accounts that they had. In addition to that, the increase of a $1.5 million, this is on the expense side. When you look and see on the revenue side, uh, you, people might have heard about the Student Opportunities Act and the Chapter 70 increase that uh, that Chapter 70 increase is the aid that comes to communities for education. In uh, the governor's release, uh, the Chapter 70 increase is $1.7 million increase. And the intent of the Student Opportunities Act funds is that it's, just the, and I'm quoting here, to go towards schools to enhance and deepen evidence-based instructional practices. So again, to Member Johnson Mussad's question about the story being told, there's another resource that we have embedded in here that is helping us tell that story as to what's going on, which is these funds and this budget that's presented on the expense side is a $1.5 million increase. And then there's additional funds, though, of that funding source that comes through the city in the Student Opportunity Act of the $1.7 million. So that's, you know, the intent being the SOA going towards what was presented in that uh, presentation. So. Just one of the, it's like two sides of the coin that we have the expense side here and then the revenue side as well. Mr. Peckett, you do have a almost, uh, I don't know, it's like a, it's a rock star way of making budgets interesting. I'm impressed. <laughs> anyway, I think we'll, we'll move to a vote on this. So we're voting on the budget. Uh, and we've made the motion. I'm looking for any abstentions. I think we should do an individual. I want to do a roll call. Someone's asking for a roll call vote. I'm yeah. fine with a roll call vote from uh, Secretary Ekstrom. We can absolutely do a roll call vote. It just feels prudent. Is anyone opposed to a roll call vote? No. It we love it. It feels prudent to me that we do a roll sure. call. Uh, Member Deneve? Yes. Secretary Ekstrom, yes. Sure. Member Johnson Massad? Yes. Member Martini? Yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Vice Chair Wall? Yes. Mayor Weegartner? Yes. We are unanimous. Thank you all. By name. Thank you for the hard work you put into the presentation, to putting, to organizing the budget, um, and we appreciate all the work of the committee and the excellent questions as well. Um, we do just have a couple more things. Our um, uh, next item of business is to vote on the settlement agreement for the Greenfield bus drivers and monitors. Um, and uh, this is something we have already uh, seen and discussed uh, the committee uh, previously in an executive session uh, as allowed by the exemptions. And so we now have um, the, the only thing that has changed since we last saw it is nothing. It's been checked and triple checked um, by the business folks, the numbers folks. Um, and the lawyer. So, you are so right. Thank you, Susan Farmer. A motion, please, to close the FY23 budget hearing. So moved. And a second. Second. Thank you. And any abstentions from closing it? Any no votes? So, we unanimously have closed the budget hearing. Thank you for reminding me. I even had it written down and I still forgot. Um, so we need a motion to approve the settlement agreement between the Greenfield School Committee and the Greenfield Bus Drivers and Monitors. 
So moved. That was Member Wall, or Vice Chair Wall, and a second. Second. That was Member Deneve. Any discussion? You should have a copy of it in your packet. I'm not hearing any discussion. We're ready to move to a vote. Looks like we are. Uh, any abstentions? Any no votes? Uh, uh -oh. Oh. Mayor abstains. The mayor's abstaining. Okay. And any no votes? So it passes with one abstention, six yeses. Thank you all for that. We do also have on the agenda a new business item. I will remind the committee, you gave us three new business items last time that we haven't addressed yet, but I'm happy to entertain any additional new business items from the committee. Or, or a motion to adjourn. So move to adjourn. Motion to adjourn from the mayors or so second? Moved. Second. A second from Member Deneve. Uh, any discussion? Any abstain abstaining votes from adjourning? Any no votes from adjourning? We are adjourned at 745. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.